Hi everyone, this is going to be a reading vlog, but this is just a quick introduction to say that I am going on a walk and I thought I would take you with me. So before we talk about books, let's go on a walk. I have made some scones and I have decanted some jam and cream into jam jars and I'm going to go and meet Sana for a walk on Hampstead Heath and we can stop and have a snack on the grass of some scones if they don't get crushed in my bag. Fingers crossed. Let's go. I just had a really disappointing moment. The other evening I had naughtily bought a jumpsuit in the Lucy and Yak sale. It looks like this. Hopefully it will arrive within this reading vlog and I can try it on and hopefully it will fit. But they had a sale and it was about half price and I thought, oh you know, you know, autumn is coming. So I purchased it and then I heard the letterbox go and something drop onto the mat. I thought, oh, maybe it is the jumpsuit. But you know, it was just a set of lateral flow tests and is that not just the biggest disappointment? It's looking a bit chaotic in this room, so let's do a time lapse clean in a minute because that's always quite satisfying. It is, what day is it? Wednesday, the 1st of September. And yesterday I filmed my reading wrap up and all of the books are piled on top of my book trolley, so I'm gonna have a sort through those. And any books that I don't want to keep, there are a few which I either really didn't enjoy or don't think I'm gonna reread. I'm gonna put outside our building for our neighbors. There's someone who lived opposite, who lives opposite us, and whenever I put books out, I see her curtain twitching and then she hurries down. So I kind of, I kind of love that. I feel like the bookish fairy godmother of the street. Uh, I'm like that with baking too. Um, there is a, like a street WhatsApp group, and occasionally if I have too many baked goods, it's like, there are baked goods outside the flat, come and get them. So I like, I like uh, secretly providing, I feel like I'm some kind of spy. People don't see me, I just leave the books and the snacks and people <laughs> can go and get them. Um, so welcome to a reading vlog. And in this video, as well as tidying, which is mainly to hold myself accountable, there will be reading in this video. Shocking, I know. My brain is feeling so chaotic at the moment. There are just so many things that I want to be reading and I really don't want to fall into that pattern of just starting loads of books and darting between them, which I am known to do a lot of the time. So I thought if I did a themed reading vlog this week, see how long it takes, then um, that would help control that urge because I know that I'm filming for this video. So gotta stay on track. Um, so the theme I thought I would pick is books that have been really hyped uh, and that I'm also keen to read. I haven't gone out and bought books that are hyped, but you know, I want to hate read or something. That's not what this channel is. I hope that you know that. Um, so I have got books that have had a lot of hype around them. And one is one that I really want to read that I have hyped up a lot. I'm not sure that other people really have, but I definitely have because the author's previous book, their last book was one of my favorite books of the year. And, 2017 so I'm very excited about it so I've picked four there are so many that I could have chosen from because there are so many hyped books coming out at the moment so maybe I'll do another one of these videos soon but the four that I've picked the first one is the one that I have hyped so this is Painting Time by Melita Karangal it's translated from the French by Sam Taylor <laughs> editing Jen here it's actually not translated by Sam it's translated by Jessica Moore I have the US edition of her last book which is translated by Sam but this time I have the UK edition so it's not as you were and her novel The Heart or Men the Living won the Welcome Prize a few years ago and was my favourite book of the year when it came out. Um, I'm not going to delve into the blurbs and stuff here because I'm going to be talking about the books when I'm reading them but this one is a book about art and art students and their entangled love lives I think. On a similar topic of entangled love lives I am going to be reading the new Sally Rooney book. I have a hit and miss relationship with Sally Rooney, loved conversations with friends, didn't really enjoy normal people. So this 
seems to be more along the lines of conversations with friends. I think it also is about a famous writer, which is obviously interesting. And then two that have been very hyped around are Night Bitch by Rachel Yoda, which is about a woman who is transforming into a dog at night, interesting. And then Assembly by Natasha Brown, which I've seen loads of people talk about. It is so short. It is a coming of age novel about a black British woman who is attending a party at her boyfriend's family's estate. It's about race and class and aspirations and privilege. So I'm keen to read this one too, obviously. That's why it's on this list. So I have these four books. I'm gonna read them over the course of this vlog and I'm gonna tell you whether or not I enjoy them, whether I think personally they deserve all the hype that they have been getting. So that is what this vlog is gonna be. This morning, um, I woke up really early. I was wide awake at five o'clock, so I decided to fall down a YouTube rabbit hole. Made a conscious decision about that, so it's all right. And I ended up watching this video called 500 Years of Haircuts, which was super fascinating. I'm going to link it down below. I think if you enjoy Rachel Maxey, then you will, you will like this video. I hadn't come across this channel before. I think her name is Morgan, if I have remembered correctly. I also decided to go through these for Christmas. My mum bought me a subscription to Olive magazine, which is a, a food magazine. And I thought because our weekly food shop comes tomorrow, so I need to do all the um, food shopping <laughs> before this evening. And I thought I would try and find something new to cook because as you know, I really like cooking, but I've definitely, which is fine, fallen into that, just make the same stuff over and over again because then I don't really have to think about it. So I wanna cook a few new things this week, but what I really wanted to try, even though summer is leaving us, it is actually quite chilly outside. When I went for a walk last night, I had to wear my winter coat. What? I decided I would make this, um, which is a strawberry cheesecake. And I've read, I've read, I have made mini cheesecakes before in jam jars. I've never made a really big one. I think they're super easy to make, but I just looked at that and I thought, you know what? That looks really good. I think I'm not gonna use shortbread biscuits which is what they tell you to use, because I have loads of those Lotus biscuits, which is the, the same brand as the Biscoff spread. So I think I might use those instead, which are, are they like gingery, kind of? Um, and I think that that will go nicely. So I'm gonna do that. But before I come back to you and talk about books and all that stuff, let's do a speed clean of this room because it needs it. You may be able to tell by the lighting that it is later. It is 10 past six and I'm taking a quick break from work to refuel with a cup of tea, talk to you a little bit about this book and then I'm gonna dive in and do a few more things. Um, some of you are asking what I'm doing work-wise at the moment and I might talk about this in uh, the vlog um, over the course of the next few days because I haven't really spoken about work recently. Um, 
And recently I've been doing a lot of work directly with publishers, editorial work, which has been really good. Um, yesterday I was working with an author who's written this amazing um, Christmas picture book, which was one of those ones that was just a joy to read and I really enjoyed working on that with her. Um, and then this afternoon I had a meeting with the head of marketing for my new book, The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers, which is coming out next month, next month. Um, and it's always weird, like pre-publication time and working out pitches for articles that I could write that would relate to the book. Um, and just talking about how we can do things to spread the word about the text. And I always feel a little bit nervous. It's not about the release of the book, really. <laughs> Maybe ask me that in a few weeks time. Maybe I'll feel nervous then. But it's more publicity surrounding books because I'm so used now to having a YouTube channel where I can control the narrative of what I'm saying and obviously as a writer I control the narrative of what I'm writing but doing publicity work that isn't simply me writing an article say being interviewed where someone else is going to write up the interview that always makes me nervous especially when talking about subjects such as disability which obviously are in my book um because I don't know how other people are going to then write about those things and that makes me a little bit anxious. I've just had bad experiences of that in the past. So that's something that I'm always continually learning to navigate and, and learn from. Um, this also right in the post, this is a whole load of poems. Let me put it down. <laughs> so heavy. A whole load of poems that I need to read to judge for a poetry competition that the Scottish Book Trust are, are doing. And I'm one of the judges for it. And I'm really excited to dive in and read those things. Anyway, so that's what I've been working on today. And I'll be working on different things in different days. And I'll talk to you about those later if you're interested. Freelance life. But yes, I did start reading this this morning before I started work. Um, and I thought that her name was pronounced Melida Carangel, which is what I've always said, but I think it's actually Mylise de Carangel. Any French people watching, tell me if that's correct. I did try and find interviews with her online and there are few and far between. So I think it is Mylise. So anyway, I am enjoying this book. I'm only, how many pages in am I? 54, but it's not a really long book. It's under 300 pages. When I read Mend the Living or The Heart, they have different titles in the UK and the US. I remember thinking that I loved that she writes in really long sweeping sentences punctuated by commas because it felt very relevant to the themes of that book, which is about heart transplants. So it felt like it was the beating of a heart and it had this breathlessness to it. But I think that is, I was going to say just her writing style, not just, but I think that is her writing style. And it definitely lends itself to the subjects that she writes about, such as the heart and in this book she's writing about painting and having these really long languid lush rich sentences mean that there are whole paragraphs that feel like paintings it's like reading paintings and i love that about it you will not enjoy this book if you like fast-paced plot-based things you will not enjoy it at all and um, if i was going to do book maths on this book i would say it is reminding me very, very slightly of Sally Rooney in that it is about 20 somethings and their complicated love lives, but it is written more like Ali Smith and things like How to Be Both. It's about three characters who met at art school and they're doing decorative painting, which is learning how to do faux painting. So painting to make something look like marble or wood when it's not those things. And we open with them reuniting years later and they're very anxious to see each other again and we don't really know why and that awkwardness is written so brilliantly and now we've gone back to them being at art school so so that's where I'm where I'm at and as I said each scene is a painting describing the light and everything that's in the room and just it's just so delightful it also does remind me slightly of The Crimson Petal and the White by Michelle Faber not thematically but the voice of it because it does have a narrator who is keeping things from you which is always you know fun to read but let me give you an example of the writing there is a beautiful scene with two of the characters holding their hands under a street lamp at night so that they can show each other all the paint and the ink that's covering their palms and the book says 
They stand for a long while, forehead to forehead, above their open palms that are the palest surfaces in the night. Stencils, stamps, transfers from far away. You would have imagined you were seeing two hikers leaning over a topographical map, staring at the paper and deciphering the legend in order to find their way. I just really, really love that image. So I'm enjoying it so far. I'll report back once I've read more. The Luciniac jumpsuit has arrived and I love it so much. So this was 72 pounds, but it was reduced to 35 and I had a five pound voucher, so it was 30 pounds. It is so well made. It is thick, so it's gonna be really good for autumn. And I'm often asked for tips of how to style Luciniac stuff, especially their tie-dye things and a jumpsuit like this, because obviously wearing this, you could just end up looking like you're a decorator, which I don't mind, really. Is she a writer? Is she a decorator? I mean, I painted all this flat myself, so technically I'm both. Um, but I thought I would just show you how I would style this or how I am styling it today. So I'm gonna do that and come back to you. Okay, so I personally would style this with a pink wig. Um, if you're new here, I wear wigs or hats because I have alopecia, so I've lost most of my hair and I have big bald patches, especially on the back of my head. So I would wear a pink wig. I don't think I would wear it with a belt. I do have um, a black belt that I could wear with this, but because it's slightly lower that I would probably want to wear a belt like on the this bit of my waist, not my stomach, because you know, girl likes to eat and uh, feel comfortable. So I mean, this isn't tight, but I really don't like tight clothing at all, as you may have noticed if you were around for a bit. And then I would pair it with a uh, chunky boots. Is this the best way for me to show you? Maybe I should put it on the camera stand, hang on. I think this is better because then we're not worrying about the focus zooming in and out. Okay, so I would wear it like this with some, some boots. And then if it was cold, I think I would pair it with an oversized denim jacket or this coat, which is also from Lucy and Yak. And if you don't want to wear boots, I would go with outrageous shoes if you have them. I mean, plain trainers, obviously fine, but I do have these, which are slightly ridiculous. And when in doubt, I say always embrace the slightly ridiculous. And I've rolled up the bottoms and you can do that with the sleeves too. But I think I actually prefer them long. And then obviously in winter when it gets cold, I would just throw a jumper over the top, maybe with a necklace. And then obviously if it's cold, you probably want a hat as well. A hat. When in doubt, I just say wear all of the patterns, even if they clash and all of the colors, even if they clash and have fun. I mean, clothes for me and wigs are just for having fun. We deserve fun in this life. <laughs> also, I made the strawberry cheesecake this morning and I'm so impatient. It's only been in the freezer for two hours and it's supposed to be in for four, but I kind of want to take it out and cut out a slice and I may massively regret this. And then I'll put the rest back in the freezer. I can hear you all screaming, telling me not to do it, but I just, I just want to, let's give it a go. Yeah, it definitely does need to set for longer, but it's pretty much there, so I'm gonna put that back in the freezer and try this. Okay, so picture the scene. I'm being super organized for tomorrow. I have made pizza dough in advance because I found that the best way to make it is to do it overnight so it does a slow rise in the fridge and you have to leave it out of the fridge for six hours before it goes in the fridge overnight. And I thought, look at me getting that done in the morning early so I can put it in the fridge later. Went to check on the dough, not rising. And I thought, oh, probably needs a bit longer because it's a little bit cold today. Nope, just remembered that I didn't put yeast in it. So that would be why it hasn't risen. So gonna have to make a second batch. So that was that not good thinking for me. Anyway, I finished painting time by my Lise de Carangal and I didn't enjoy it, <laughs> which I know really contradicts my last clip where I was talking about this book and I was like, it's so beautiful, it's so amazing. Um, it is beautiful and I think that there are individual sections of this book, like the one that I read in the last clip, that I really, really love. 
But overall, I felt as though it didn't particularly work, though I think that that may be deliberate because there are parts of this book where the narrator and Paula, our main character, is talking about painting and what she's being taught about doing this decorative painting and how you need to focus on all of the tiny details so that if anyone stares at the tiny details, they're not going to notice that it's fake. But at the same time, if you step back and you look at the whole picture, something has to seem off. Like They have to know that they're looking at something that's being replicated and not a knockoff or so a bad replica in the sense of ripping off paintings it's supposed to be recognizable as a reconstruction so it's supposed to feel weird if you look at the big texture but it's supposed to not feel weird if you're looking at the really small details so I think probably that is something that she has applied very cleverly to this book whereby there are individual paragraphs that are so beautiful and full of detail and amazing but when you zoom out and you try and look at the characters their lives don't feel particularly real and they don't feel as though they exist smoothly in all the spaces that they're moving in, but they do exist very permanently in those beautiful moments where we glimpse them. So I appreciate that craftsmanship in transposing painting details and what our characters are doing into the composition of this novel. I think that's actually really wonderful and I would love to maybe write an essay about it, but I don't think it made for a hugely enjoying reading experience. It's so hard when we get down to talking about craft and enjoyment, but ultimately I think these two things have to coexist together and for me that they, they just didn't in this instance. I would definitely recommend Men the Living over this, but who I would recommend this for, which I think actually is a huge recommendation given how many people love it, I would recommend this for Fans of Normal People by Sally Rooney. Really, really would. So if you enjoy Normal People, which I think is pretty much everyone in the world apart from me, then, then please do give this a go. See what you think of it and then let me know because I would love to talk about it with people because it's one of those novels that yeah, there's a lot to dissect. So I appreciated it, but I didn't love it. On to the next book. Okay, so pizza take two. It's not probably going to be my best pizza dough because I had to redo it and therefore it couldn't rise out of the fridge as long as I perhaps would have liked it to. It did four hours instead of six. Um, but let me tell you how I make pizza now. I've spoken about pizza a few times on this channel because I've been in a constant... Like, mode of trying to find the best way of doing it but this is my favorite way of doing it at the moment so this is the flour that I use and I buy this um oh, sorry the zoom is zooming around there we go so this is the flour that I use which is amazing for pizza and I buy it in bulk um, because it isn't the cheapest but I tend to buy maybe 10 of them at a time and we just go through them. I also buy this in bulk as you can see I buy a whole cardboard shelf which is what you would get in a supermarket but um, this is uh, Marty pizza sauce they also do great chopped tomatoes so this is basically just pureed tomatoes I think that's all that's in this one it doesn't even have anything added into it. Um, you can get ones with extra herbs and stuff. This is just to tomatoes. Um, so what I do is I make a load of pizza. So every so often Mr. M and I like to have what we call a pizza weekend. <laughs> so this is one kilogram of flour. So I mix one kilogram of flour with one sachet of seven grams of yeast with a huge slug of olive oil, I don't know, five tablespoons or something, about 20 grams of salt and 600, gra 600 grams, 600 milliliters of warm water. And then I knead that for 15, 20 minutes, leave it to rise for two hours. Then after two hours, you should cut the dough into about seven, eight pieces, make sure they're all of similar size, and then put them in Tupperware or if you're if you don't have loads of fridge space because this is tricky obviously it's a lot of fridge space you can um like wrap them in something put them on a baking tray in dough balls and wrap them tightly um with some kind of covering so this time i have put them in tupperware and then you leave them out for a further four hours then put them in the fridge overnight then you want to take them out of the fridge four hours before you make the pizza 
I know this sounds like a lot, but really it's just about remembering to move things around. What you're actively doing, you know, the kneading and whatever is so minimal. It's just about remembering to put things in the fridge, take them out of the fridge, all that stuff. So as you can see, they have expanded. I say you can see, I didn't show you what they looked like beforehand, but you can see all the bubbles. Um, if I left this out for the full six hours instead of four, I think this dough would be filling the entire Tupperware box. So it might not be as yummy as it normally would be, but it's still going to be pretty good. When it comes to cooking, this is my favorite kind of mozzarella. And what I do, I'll do an overlay here so that you can see what I do, but I just take one piece of dough and make it into about a 10 inch pizza with a raised crust around the edge. And then I fry it on a really, really high heat in a super nonstick pan until it's bubbling and the bottom is browning, at which point I put on the tomatoes and any other toppings, cheese and stuff. And then I put the same pan under the grill for two minutes so that the top puffs up and the cheese melts. And that is my favorite way to make pizza. I know in the States you can broil, but we don't tend to have that in our ovens here. So yeah, pizza time. And then as I said, sometimes we'll just have a pizza weekend where we'll eat six pizzas over the course of the weekend, just whenever we fancy one. I'll just go cook one. And I really enjoy doing that. It's a fun thing to do. Obviously, I think this recipe is better if you're catering to loads of different people, but we're not at the moment. And you can freeze the dough too, though I haven't done that yet. So I don't know how well that works, but you can do it. Of days ago that I had to wear my winter coat when I went out for an evening walk and the autumn was here and I feel like summer heard me and thought excuse me are you saying that I'm terrible at my job let me prove it to you that I can do my job so summer is back it is as hot I was gonna say as the sun it's not as hot as the sun it's hot outside it's gonna reach I think about 30 degrees over the next few days which is very hot for someone who can't regulate their own body temperature so no wig today and I am staying inside mostly uh, may go for a walk this evening but I have finished reading assembly by Natasha Brown so the second book on this vlogs TBR and this is a book like with texts such as Olivia Lang's Crudo where a lot of the reading process is thinking about what is not being said on the page and what you are not granted access to in the character's head but that's perfectly balanced by giving you just enough information to really feel the tension and anger of the character and realize all the things that they are not expressing or at least a lot of the things that they are not expressing. Um, this is a very meta book with lots of layers to it even though it's only 100 pages long. It is not a book that is about storytelling. It reads very much like non-fiction and as I mentioned at the beginning of this vlog this is a novel about a young black British woman who is going to her white boyfriend's family estate for a party. This novel is about race and inherited trauma, inherited wealth and navigating existing in spaces where the other people in those spaces just don't understand the disconnect that they have with you or with society as a whole because of how they grew up. So a lot of her boyfriend's family, they're incredibly rich and they often say, that the best things in life are free and she's just seething thinking of course you think that the best things in life are free because everything is free to you and then she also has awkward conversations with people at work where a white guy who grew up without much money says well you know we're the same because we cancel each other out because you have a really high profile job now which cancels out your blackness just as me like being a white guy from an impoverished background makes me less of an elitist person when it comes to society as a whole and when we talk about race and she's like these are false comparisons like everyone is making false comparisons and trying to make themselves I think feel more comfortable with the lot that they have been given in life and she's just so over trying to 
explain to people what it's like being a black woman in a professional role where everybody has the opinion about who she is or who she should be. And the writing of this book, as I said, is quite meta because the author, Natasha Brown, also works um, in finance like the main character does. And I did read an interview where she said that when she wrote this book, she would write it for 20 minutes at a time, snatch minutes, because she was working long hours. Um, whereas the boyfriend in this text is always saying, oh, maybe I will write a book and I want to write something really long and languid and take my time with it because those are the really important books. And he has time to do that because his family just keep on giving him money. Whereas the main character in this book just doesn't have time because there is just so much going on in her life, not just to do with her job, but just so much noise from society that is screaming inside her brain. Consequently, this text is very fragmented to reflect that. There's one bit where the boyfriend says, he wishes he could be like me, take up a soulless city job, make a metric shit ton of money, but all this, he waves an obligatory arm at the musty shelves around him. It demands more of him. There's a legacy to uphold. It's a compulsion. He says he has a compulsion to make his mark on this world. It's been bred into him. So he thinks it's cute that she's trying to prove herself in the city by making lots of money. He's like, I don't need to do that because, you know, my family already proved themselves. I just get to sit here. And if I wanted to write a book, it would be a long philosophical book um, playing devil's advocate because I don't really need to critically examine the world around me because the world is mine. She creates a really deeply uncomfortable set of scenes with dialogue like that. The the only thing I was unsure about in this book, and this is something that's at the very beginning, is that the main character has cancer and she has gone to a clinic um, because she w was worried about a lump that she had found. And it seems that throughout the book, racism and colonialism are being referred to like as that cancer. I always feel a little bit uncomfortable when writers use illness or disability as a metaphor for something societal, especially in a book like this where she's already talking overtly about those things. So in a way that extended metaphor felt a little bit redundant. Um, so I don't know how I feel about that. That's something that I have to think about, but I did enjoy the, the rest of the writing and I'm really keen to see what she brings out next. Hello, it is Tuesday. I haven't checked in in a couple of days. I went for a walk really early this morning before it got hot and the light on the heath was beautiful, but that is not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the next book that I finished reading, which I read over the weekend, which is Night Bitch by Rachel Yoda. And this book, let me tell you, reading this book whilst PMSing was a ride, a ride. So this is about a woman who is called the mother and she is exhausted, she is frustrated with the way that society puts all of the responsibility of raising the child onto her and her husband gets to come home from work and not really lift a finger and that manifests in her turning into a dog. And this is not a book where it's just something, you know, she feels it and that's a simile that's going on. No, 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 no. She's turning into a dog, she's turning into a dog and that is how she lets out her rage. She feels like she's returning to some kind of primal state. And I thought that this was a brilliant extended metaphor for motherhood. I would say this is like Carmen Maria Machado meets Sarah Moss. If you enjoy those writers, then you will enjoy this. I thought maybe for the first half or at least the first third that this book was going to be one of my favorite books of the year. I don't think it is going to be because I did feel like it became a little bit repetitive in places. I wasn't sure if that was deliberate to reflect the re repetitiveness, monotonous like life of, of motherhood when you're so completely exhausted. But I, I feel like really this could have been cut back a little bit and it would have been stronger for it. The mother used to be an artist before she became a mother and she keeps saying that to people, you know, I, I used to be an artist in this really apologetic way, like I'm just a mother now, all the 
you know, air quotes, until she realizes that maybe actually sod that and maybe her life actually is art. It's messy and it's hard to get to grips with and it's super subjective because everyone's experience of motherhood is subjective. It's hard to get to grips with from the outside like art is. Like the motherhood and art share so many similarities and she thinks that maybe there's this secret mythology that she suddenly accessed that other women don't know how to communicate their experiences of because everyone's just so gosh darn tired. Um, so I really, really love the themes in this book and it is hilarious in places as well as being disturbing. I would definitely recommend it. Also slightly reminiscent of The Vegetarian by Hong Kong as well enjoyed this one. I'm running some writing workshops online this morning, doing editorial work this afternoon, and then tonight I want to dive into the new Sally Rooney, which as you can see I'm kind of camouflaged with accidentally today. I got a lovely email in my inbox over the weekend from some actors in Mexico who I had spoken to before because they'd been in touch to ask if they could make a play and a film about, well, adapting one of the poems from my book, The Girl Aquarium. And they sent me the footage that they had created and it's so creepy and and wonderful. Um, so that was really fun. It's always a privilege when someone wants to adapt your work. And the poem that they adapted was called I Wish to Tell You Body Parts, which is from my book, The Girl Aquarium, which is about the history of the freak show and girlhood and bodily difference, fairy tales. I will leave a link in the description box down below if you'd like to go find out more. But it's one of the more abstract poems from the book and it begins, I wish to tell you body parts, the heart of a young girl, the heart of a pig, the heart of the matter, the heart is brains, the heart is wood, the heart within its glossy feathers, the heart runs, the heart boils, the heart burns, the heart beats underground. The next part is about stomach and then the third part is about a pair of lungs which goes the lungs of a wise woman, the lungs of a centipede, the lungs of dancing figurines, the lungs of half-born seas, the lungs as peppered earth, the lungs as bubbled rock, the lungs pop, the lungs melt, the lungs yell, the lungs bloom under water by which point I can never like think of the word lung in the same way again and it's a bit of a tongue twister. So they sent me through that film, which I don't think I can share here, but I can show you some quick stills and you can see how they have knitted body parts and then put lights inside them and then they're wearing them and they have this really um, creepy voiceover and I just, I just really enjoyed it. So that was really lovely. Anyway, I'm gonna get on with my working day now and I will be back to speak to you about Sally Rooney once I have read it. It's only the next morning. I read this book all last night, so let's talk about it. This is Sally Rooney's third book, Beautiful World, Where Are You? As I said at the beginning of this vlog, I really enjoyed her first book, Conversations with Friends. I didn't like her second book, Normal People, very much. And often I hear people having the reverse opinion of that. Like m Many more people, at least in my experience, seem to prefer normal people to Conversations with Friends. This third book is definitely more similar to Conversations with Friends, which was a plus point for me, but maybe not for other people. This is about four characters, Alice, Eileen, Simon and Felix, who are all friends with each other, or rather Felix kind of enters this triangle, it becomes a square, and it's about their tangled love lives, as you would expect from Sally Rooney. Um, and I've seen lots of Sally Rooney bingo cards knocking around, you know, criticizing capitalism gets you a point, uh, inexplicable trip to Europe gets you a point, um, deconstructing gender norms gets you a point, in-depth sexual encounters gets you a point, it basically ticks all of the things on any Sally Rooney card that I, I have seen. Now the fact that I'm coming back to you the next morning having only started this last night should tell you that this is a very readable book, which I would say is true of all of her books. She tells you exactly what the characters are doing and a note that I made to myself in the margins of this book when reading is that Sally Rooney tells you all of the dead ends and that is both slightly infuriating as a reader but also what I think makes her work not compelling, it's, it's sometimes the opposite of that, but it it makes her fiction feel very real. So she'll tell you every time a character takes their phone out of their pocket to see if they've got any new notifications. And I think normally 
in a book that would be because they do have a new notification and that means they're going to talk to someone or go somewhere and it drives the plot but it's not it's just the mundane things that these characters are doing they continually take their phones out they'll take photos of things that they then delete they will cook something and this is not because they're cooking for someone else it's just the boring thing that they have to do when they get home from work she'll tell you how long they put things in the microwave for she'll tell you the color of each garment of clothes that they are wearing and yes sometimes you're like okay so is this is this going to lead to the next part of plot and and sometimes it will but most of the time it won't and I quite like that maze that she creates in this book like she's playing with readers expectations. Our main character is Alice who has moved from Dublin to the countryside has recently had a bit of a breakdown. She is a writer who has two novels published and all the literary world thinks that they know who she is and she finds it very overwhelming. I can see why Sally Rooney wrote a character like that, given that is exactly the trajectory that she has been on, continues to be on. And there is wonderful commentary in this book about novels and what novels are for and how literary worlds lock novelists up in a small space and say, you're so great, tell us more about how you perceive life. But then they're not expected to observe or be within life anymore they're just supposed to write about it and they get further and further removed from the lives that they are attempting to catalogue or mythologize. Alice is a writer her friend Eileen is someone that she writes to via email and Eileen is a copy editor she also works for a literary magazine that isn't very successful and I think that that juxtaposition is interesting that Alice is the successful one and Eileen sees her as someone who is writing the own narrative of her life very much in control of her work and where she's going whereas Eileen is left behind to edit other people's work to correct their tiny mistakes and get no recognition or praise for that so I thought that imagery worked really well. The characters communicate or at least Eileen and Alice communicate via email a lot of the time in this very heightened version of themselves you know like when John Green characters talk in these fully formed sentences and you just think no one really talks like that but it doesn't matter because it's an art form this is their performative selves via email writing to each other they have kind of created this fake relationship with each other they love each other very much but they don't actually want to exist in person in each other's spaces mostly Eileen and Alice don't want to do that like they they enjoy this the version that each of them has of their own relationship which can only be sustained if they stay far away from each other so they keep saying they're going to see each other and then they just they don't and I think when that's happening that tension is really interesting and looking at how they tell each other about their lives when we have seen in the novel what's been going on in their lives and how they alter it when they're reporting it to each other is really fascinating. Something that I found frustrating here and have found frustrating before with her work is that her characters are complex and that's a good thing so sometimes they'll be really upset and that will materialise in anger and they'll lash out and want to hurt the people that they love and that ends up in a lot of miscommunication. I just feel like that happens too many times to be believable. I, I stop having sympathy with these complex characters and instead just want to shake them and maybe that's the point but it's not something that I enjoy either reading or, or dissecting so I definitely got to that point for me towards the end of the book um, and also towards the end it kind of got a little bit too much into our own world in a way that I didn't particularly want to read about which I think is a personal preference and I won't say more because of spoilers it just kind of took me out of the text a bit. I really enjoyed the first half of this book. The second half not so much. For serving tea on the book industry I give it a big old tick um, but it didn't make me fall in love with it more than conversations with friends did so I think it sits in the middle of conversations with friends and normal people for me um, and if you're reading it I would love to know what you think of it. So I finished reading all of those four books. The My Least of Karen Gal was my least favourite one and this was the one that I'd hyped up to myself. Um, the Sally Rooney book didn't live up to the hype for me but I suppose my own personal hype I was pleasantly surprised by a lot of this given how much I hadn't enjoyed 
her last book and I definitely loved it more than more normal people so somewhere in the middle for me the Natasha Brown book I thought was really interesting as I said I would be really intrigued to read whatever she brings out next and then the winner for me out of these four was Night Bitch by Rachel Yoda which I thought definitely lived up to the hype even though as I said I thought it could be shortened to make it a bit tighter in places i did think the extended metaphor worked very well it is horrifying but also hilarious had a real balance um of emotions and tone and and i really really love that so we've reached the end of this vlog i imagine this vlog is going to be quite long if you're still here thank you very much for joining me if you're new to this channel please do subscribe it would be lovely to have you around and if you would like to support my channel over on patreon that would also be very kind i'll leave a link to that in the description box down below i hope you're all having a good week and i will be back with another video very soon lots of love bye